I, I'm so happy to be here today. I have to say, I love being in recovery. I love being asked to come here and speak because I have, because it makes me further my recovery. I have to write something up. And I started thinking about this today. I, well, not today. As last week, I was thinking illusionary safeguards. I keep wanting to do something about that. And so I did. And let's see here. What's the holdup? All right. And this is straight out of the Coda book. For some people, <clears throat> be, placing faith and belief in a higher power may be difficult because it means letting go of illusionary safeguards. It means believing or being willing to believe that a power greater than ourselves can do for us what we're unable to do for ourselves. Had a tough time with this one because I really thought I was doing just fine other than the, you know, little drinking problem perhaps and, you know, little picadillos in my character. But other than that, I was doing great. Definition of illusion, this is straight out of the dictionary, which, by the way, I love going to the dictionary because, as it turns out, I don't know everything, uh, contrary to my previous uh, belief. A definition of illusion is something, something that deceives by producing a false or misleading impression of reality. Our perceptions are skewed as codependents. It, that's not our fault. That's just the way it is. And the definition of a safeguard is something that serves as a protection or defense that ensures our safety. Now, we've been masters at this for a long time now. We had to be. We had uh, childhoods that weren't um, uh, stable. You know, my, my childhood was very volatile. I never really knew what was happening, what was going to come next. It, if I did this one particular thing on Tuesday and then did it again on Thursday, on Thursday, it wasn't, it wasn't okay. It wasn't correct. And I got punished, but on Tuesday it was okay. So I'm, I kept thinking, I remember thinking this as a kid, if you can just write down the rules for me, I'll follow them. You know, I will, but you can't change a midstream, you know, set a rule, I'll follow it. And that's it. The source of our illusionary safeguards is our need to be in control of people, places, things, and situations. Not our fault. When I use the patterns of codependence, anonymous, which is control, denial, compliance, low self-esteem, and avoidance, I am seeking to gain a false sense of security, not realizing that the change I affect is only temporary. I didn't know that. Let me give you an example. Let's see if that's the name. Yeah. For example, I can manipulate someone into sending me flowers on Valentine's Day, but I haven't changed their basic nature. Next year, I'm going to have to manipulate them again. So that's what we mean by the temporary and short-term changes. I think I've done, okay, got that handled. Now I'm going to get flowers every year. That's not true. But I thought it was. <clears throat> Our spiritual dilemma, so often referred to in CODA, is simply this. If I am in control, I'm the higher power. If I give you control, I'm making you the higher power. And that's not a good thing. If I'm forcing somebody to be my higher power, that's a lot of responsibility for them. They're in charge of my happiness, my upkeep, my financial security. They're, they've got a lot on their shoulders as soon as I make them have the power which is why I usually kept the power for myself. Here's a great question. If I offered you a million dollars to jump out of a plane without a parachute, would you do it? Well, codependents are funny people. You'll get buried answers on this one. Yeah, I'll give it a shot if it's over water, you know, stuff like that. But how about if I told you the plane had never left the ground? The problem with codependence is we don't look at all the facts first. That's kind of a side issue. The facts come second. So what's keeping you from having an actual higher power, a real higher power? I believe it's the seven deadly needs. And those are the reasons that we need to stay in control. We use them to stay in control. Let's see what they are. The need to know. The reason we need to know things is because if we can dissect it and study it, we will eventually be able to explain it and then we can control it. The need to not appear stupid is pride-based. The 
the pride issue for us is the center of the onion. If you, you know, that peeling the layers off the onion and stuff, when you finally get to the part where it makes you not look very good, you're in the middle. You're done. <clears throat> Excuse me, I have a weird throat today. The need to be right. There's nothing wrong with being right. It's the need to be right all the time that's deadly. It separates. If I have to be right, what do you have to be? You've got to be wrong. It has to be, you know, black and white, good, bad, right, wrong. And it's pride based. The need to get even. <clears throat> The scales of justice will probably never get perfectly balanced, not in this lifetime and not by us. There's really no such thing as getting even. Perhaps a bigger question is, why do I need to get even? Is my pride involved? Yeah, yeah, it is. Every time. I mean, the need to look good. To get over the tyranny of looking good, I have to take the terrible risk of letting others see me when I'm not at my best when I may feel very foolish and vulnerable. This is also based on pride. All of these are based on pride and control and the lengths that we'll go to to keep what we think is control. The need to judge. Maybe we judge people so we can decide things about them, we separate ourselves from them, good or bad, thumbs, you know, thumbs up, thumbs down, guilty or innocent. Maybe we should just let them be who they are warts and all. This is what acceptance is. And this came from uh, the AA book in one of the stories. It's an amazingly popular and, and very true statement, acceptance. Acceptance is the answer to all of my problems today. When I am disturbed, it is because I find some person, place, thing, or situation, some fact of my life unacceptable to me. And I can find no serenity until I accept that person, place, thing, or situation as being exactly the way it's supposed to be at this moment. Things are constantly changing. Uh, if, you, if you're a Buddhist, you already know this, that nothing stays the same. It's second by second, things are changing. Your situation, your place, your person, whatever it is, it's changing. It might be getting worse, but it might be getting better. We don't know. This might be a good time to throw in my Chinese farmer story, actually. <clears throat> if I haven't said this one before, you might not have heard it. There was uh, centuries ago, there was an old Chinese farmer, and he only had one son left on the farm, and they were doing all the work themselves, and they only had one horse. Uh, one day, that horse ran off. And all the neighbors gathered around and said, oh, my God, I'm so sorry. This is such terrible news. I'm, I'm so sorry for you. And the old man says, well, it might be good, might be bad, I don't know yet. And a couple of weeks later, the horse came back and brought friends, brought three more horses with them. And the neighbors say, wow, that, that's fantastic. That's so great. That's such good news. And the farmer says, yep, might be good, might be bad, I don't know yet. A week later, the son was breaking, uh, breaking the horses in and he fell and broke his leg. And the neighbors, oh my God, that's so terrible. I'm so sorry to hear that. That's awful. Farmer says, might be good, might be bad. I don't know yet. Three weeks later, the Chinese army came marching through, taking all the healthy young men to go to war. And they couldn't take his son because his leg was broken. Moral of the story is we don't know. We don't know what we think we know. So if we just accept things as being the way they are right now and not put a label of good or bad on there, don't categorize it. We're going to buy. I live my life now kind of looking at situations going, huh, how about that? And that's about it. The need to keep score. <laughs> Get out of the results business. If your job is to load the wagon, just load the wagon. Don't worry about the mule. The results will take care of themselves. Don't keep checking to see what the score is. It doesn't matter. If you're loading the wagon, just load it. Leave the mule to the mule department. I love that. Your pride is what tells you you need to be better than other people, or at least to be seen as better than other people. That's important. I learned that from my parents. They look great all the time. And the need to control. Control is an illusion. Might want to, you know, if you're not sure about that one, write it down. Control is an illusion. 
The need to control is fear-based and fear is pride-based. There's only two fears. I'm afraid I'm going to lose something I already have, or I'm afraid I'm not going to get something I think I want or need. And that's it. <clears throat> if you, by the way, anybody wants a copy of this, you don't need to write this stuff down. If you want a copy, I'm going to put my email in the chat so you can get a copy of it. Oh, this is a great story. It's terrible. It's a tragic story, but it's a good, good example. There was a man who had fallen while climbing a mountain at night. He was hanging in the air by his safety rope, and he cried out to his higher power to save him, and he heard a strange message. Cut the rope. The man thought that was madness, and he would surely die if he cut the rope, so he stayed where he was. In the morning, the search team found him, still hanging, dead from exposure, two feet off the ground. Don't question your higher power. You know, we get these instincts that tell us, don't go in there, you know, or don't do that, or, or do this, or don't do that, or uh, whatever it is, whatever that little instinctual message is telling us, I believe that's your higher power. So when you get those instincts, don't, don't, because I, I always hear that later, oh, I should have listened to my gut. <laughs> okay, yeah, you should have. It's time to consider having a real higher power of your own choosing. You get to cut your own deal. That's the good part. You get to decide what your God is going to be. I used to have the flowing robes guy uh, for a long time, and it took me a while to find a higher power of my understanding and my choosing. But, I, you know, I finally did. And it's important that you get the higher power you need. And here's my fantastic worksheet. This is so cool. My sponsor wrote this up initially, and I asked her if I could use it because it was so great. There was nothing I would change about it. And she said, well, I'd rather you made your own. I'm like, gosh, she's so selfish. And then I thought, no, she's not selfish. She's helping me grow up. So this is similar to hers, but I changed some of the wording. Just some of it. So now it's mine. <laughs> so what do we have here? We've got a list down here at the bottom, all kinds of, of um, behaviors, okay? And an unhealthy behavior, what did you do? What feelings urged this behavior? What did you want to gain? And what should you do instead? This is a really nice worksheet if you're having trouble. If you are feeling off about something or, or you don't know if you're right or wrong about something, do this really quick. Just pick a word from the bottom here. Uh, sarcastic, you know, hypervigilance, whatever it is. We're going to do some, I'm going to have some fun with this. We're going to uh, take some examples that you all might have. And let's work through it together. Because this, this is what we do. We do these things together. Pick a word. Okay. I picked complaining. Kind of my go-to mechanism there. And what unhealthy behavior did I act out? I would come home from work complaining about my boss and how heavy my workload was and how unfair it all seemed. I'm a big thing on unfair. That's not fair. Okay, I've got a problem with that, but that's okay. So what feelings urged me to use that behavior? I felt unappreciated and burdened, forsaken. Nobody was paying any attention to me. I was just working like a dog. Seemed like everybody got the attention but me. You know, they, everybody else was getting raises. Everybody else is getting awards and all this stuff. And I'm just coming into work on time, doing my work and going home. And I was just kind of ignored. Well, what did I want to gain from complaining about it? I wanted sympathy, support, and understanding. I want to be recognized as a good and valuable member of the team. And who has the power in this one? I gave my power to someone else's opinion of me. They're my higher power. Okay. What should I do instead? I'm going to validate myself instead of seeking this from outside sources. I'll worry about my own job and try not to control somebody else's. If I don't have a great boss who's really good at nurturing his employees and things like that, oh, well. Uh, there's, oh, well, so what? And there's got to be more than that. There's little two-word, little, oh, well, so what? I can't concern myself with somebody else's behavior. I can only 
adjust my own sales. And then I really figured out that I actually was not as good of an employee as I thought I was. This was weird. I, I just Honestly, you could have knocked me over with a feather to hear about that. But let me bring that back up. Where's the needs? There's the needs. Here we go. I was, uh, let's see, need to control, need to keep score. Gosh, I was doing all of this stuff. Need to be right. There I am. Need to be right. I had to be right all the time. And I would lie to look good. I would do whatever I had to do to make you think I was fantastic. And this is actually, you know, it's pride based. Of course, pride is the worst of the seven deadly sins. That's why it's listed first. If I have to be right, you have to be wrong. If you're winning, that means I'm losing. So that kind of black and white thinking and, and you know, good and bad, all or nothing type stuff that got me into trouble a lot. I'll just leave that there. But I wasn't getting the juju that I thought I should be. Let's try another one. Helplessness. This was so awful. I got really mad when I picked up my milkshake and the lid wasn't on tight and it spilled all over my car. Couple of problems there. Now I don't, don't get to drink my milkshake because it's on the bottom of my car. Now I got to clean up my car. There's a lot of problems here. And I'd already gone through the drive through so I couldn't complain or bitch at, at the person who might be responsible for that. So I was just sitting there fuming about this, trying to find some sort of napkin or something in my car to clean this up. You know, you don't really carry cleaning supplies in your car very much. I should. But what feelings urged me to use this behavior? I felt punished. I was victimized. And I felt slothful. I did not want to clean this up. Sorry. You know, I shouldn't have to. Not my fault. Again, that, it's not fair. What did I hope to gain from being mad, concern, empathy, and help cleaning it up? You're supposed to feel sorry for me, damn it. I gave my power to the conditions. What should I do instead? Drop into acceptance. This is it. This is, this is what's going on right now. That's all. Nobody did this to me. I'm not a victim. Stop whining and clean it up. It's just the way it is right now. Now when these things happen, I usually just laugh. I, which is, I know that sounds odd, but I'm weird like that. I, I just, I just start laughing. I'll go, well, there's another shake down the drain. You know, my car gets to drink it and not me. And I put up here obsessing. I worry that my sister isn't taking care of my mother, right? I think I should step in. <laughs> what is, <laughs> it makes me laugh to read that. What feelings urged this? Useless and separated. I wasn't needed. You know, I don't like that. I got edged out by my perfect sister. That was kind of a weird story. Mom and I were living together. Once my life imploded from alcoholism, mom says, come up and live with me. I'm thinking, God, what a horrible idea. But I did it anyway because I was out of options. And we got to know each other. We traveled extensively. We had a really good time. It was it was amazing. We did. We had a good time. And then my older sister's life impl imploded. My older, uh, smarter, thinner sister wanted to come live with us. And I went running over to my sponsor's house. I said, "This is gonna. This is bad. It's gonna ruin everything." And it did. You get three, especially female personalities in one house. Here's the drama triangle persecutor, victim, and rescuer. And that's the way we rolled around for the rest of the time that I was there. But now she is living with mom, taking care of her. Mom's 90 now. And uh, I just, I feel like I should be part of the decision-making process, you know, because I'm so important and special. And really, I'm trying to take the power for myself rather than giving this up to a higher power. I don't need to do any of this stuff, you see. I don't need to do any of this. If I have a higher power that I can give everything up to and just not put my, my paws on, everything works out like it's supposed to. And what should I do instead? I shouldn't push myself into a situation I'm not needed in. It's just to soothe my pride anyway. I didn't want to help. I just wanted to be recognized as a decision maker or an important member of the family or whatever. Um. And that's really all it was for me. And I would like to hear from other people and open it up so that we can 
discuss some of the, these things ourselves. Go ahead and pick one of the words from the bottom and write out one of these lines. Pick a, a, a word or two words from the bottom, put it right here under the pick a word from the list. What unhealthy behavior did you act out? What feelings urged you to use this behavior? And what did you want to get out of that? You did it for a reason. And then what should you do instead? And let's just give it a couple of minutes. I'm going to put my email in the chat in the meantime. Yeah. Yeah. His concerns are not your concerns. But let's find out what the actual problem is. I'm going to bring up another spreadsheet that I use for, oops, way too big. Hold the phone. All right. Here's a worksheet if you want to do a quick four step on what the problem is. So you've got, this is your boss, right? Okay. And what did, what did it affect? Uh, emotional, physical, sexual, I hope not, spiritual or intellectual? Uh, I hope I'm spelling this right. Uh, not even close. Okay. What pattern did you respond to with? What did you do about it? Control, low self-esteem, compliance, denial, or avoidance? Okay. What was your old idea? By an old idea, I mean, if I say or do this or that, they will say or do this or that, and then everything will be okay. Then I'll be happy or I'll be safe or I'll be satisfied, whatever it is. What do you think on this one? All right. And what pattern are you using to keep the relationship going? In other words, we, in our minds, we have to fix this in our heads to where it's our fault. That's odd, but it's true. If you take the blame on yourself, then you're still in control, if that makes any sense. Can't be his fault because he's the boss. He's supposed to know everything and, and, and all that. And plus, he's got control over your finances. So how am I going to make this work in my head? Am I going to deny that it's really bad? Am I going to use my low self-esteem and tell myself I've got it coming? Uh, am I going to comply with no matter what he says or does? or try to control it somehow by going to HR. <laughs> Two of my favorites, and these are the easiest ones. If you don't know what to do, just avoid the whole thing. How's your pride affected on this? Badly affected. Does he make you feel stupid? Worse yet. Okay. What are the consequences to your relationship? What happened? You could probably have a good relationship if it weren't for this. But apparently, if you're using avoidance, then you're just trying to duck under your desk when he comes in the room, stuff like that. Yeah, that's a shame. I had a boss that was similar. I, I did. I, and, and he used to gaslight me and tell me that it was kind of my fault that that uh, I was feeling these feelings. He would gaslight me all the time by telling me, you know, you're a Scorpio just like me. So don't get how you get. I'm like, what? <laughs> what? How do I get? You know, uh, saying things like that, that would put me on the defense right away. Mm. And then I figured him out. Um, as it turns out, my boss that I'm talking about now was a liar. He liked to be a rescuer or a hero. Now, see if your boss has any of these characteristics, okay? Because you, as soon as you can figure out what his deal is, you won't be hurt by him anymore. My particular boss needed to be the rescuer, so he would actually make up scenarios that weren't even happening to tell me that I was in trouble upstairs and that I better, you know, stay low and don't worry. He's got my back and he'll he's going to take care of it and all this. And I finally went to the person and said, you know, I'd like maybe we can talk directly about this. They had no idea what I was talking about. So that was his way of staying in control of me. I don't yeah. know if that's what's happening with you. 
is your boss under a lot of pressure from his boss. And that feels a lot like when you were a little kid, huh? Yeah. All this stuff that you're feeling now, these strong emotions that we have, they're from our history. And when we bring that stuff forward, we not only feel it like we felt it then, but it's as an adult, it's helpless. It's you can't do anything about it. You can't go anywhere just like you were when you were a little kid, can't move out. You know, you're only 10, right? <laughs> so you're stuck. Mm -hmm. And that's that feeling that you're getting is I, I'm helpless. I am yeah. stuck here. And it's always going to be like this. Does that make sense? That's a bad feeling. And I'm, I'm very familiar with that one. There are a lot of things that can change this. He might get a raise and he might go off and, and, and uh, start managing a different department or something like that. Wouldn't that be great? But he's going to be replaced by another boss. And until you get yourself straight to where that that the little girl takes a nap and you bring your adult to work instead, that's when the change is going to occur. This is difficult because it makes you take a step down or two. You know, you could be right about that is another good expression. I'm not saying you are right, but you could be. You could be right about that. And when with my particular boss, I started realizing that I was not giving him the respect that he deserved just because he was my boss, just for that. Uh, you don't have to respect him as a person, don't have to like him, but he is your boss. And usually I, uh, what I found out that they just want it done right. You know, the, all these the nitpicky things and all that stuff that they were saying and doing, that's because they want it done right. That's it. Had nothing to do with me. And I can almost guarantee you that none of this stuff that he's making you feel has anything to do with you and him, no. you know? So take a look at yourself, work on why you feel bad. He's not making you feel anything. You're doing that. Okay. So give that some thought and kind of unwind. How much of this is real and how much am I making up? How much have I brought on myself? How much am I, you know, see what you're, what you've decided about this. Uh, that might make a difference. I hope it does. <laughs> You're the only one in the room, so it has to be you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anytime I have trouble, I go look in the mirror because that's where the problem is. It's <laughs> something that I'm reacting to. That's all it is. My perception is skewed, always was. So, and I hope this works out for you gloriously. Who else wants to give it a whirl? I mean, this is fun, right? <laughs> Okay, so let's let's check that out because I have a feeling that this was part of your not only your childhood, it has to be or it wouldn't be bothering you. Which one of your parents was overbearing and mm -hmm. very controlling? Maybe mine's maybe oh, mom. Okay. But yeah. I'm kind of a good typer, but it's like I have Tourette's when my nails get a little bit too long. Anyway, <laughs> what did this affect? Okay, good. Okay, and <clears throat> what pattern did you react with? When you're texting your, your ex-husband, what pattern are you reacting with when he texts you back and says, mind your business? That's hard for people to get to get used to our new code of personality. It says it right in the book. Some people are going to be unhappy with your new personality. I'm going to put money on everybody is everybody that's used to you being in a particular way and they need you to stay that way so that they can deal with you appropriately. He knows that all he has to do is say this and you will do that. Right. Now that you have a different personality, it's hard for him as well to adjust to having to answer to you for one thing. So what pattern did you react with when he responded to your texts? Because it used to be compliance. That's what he's used to. All right. So you being in control is probably not a happy thing for him. Uh, what was your old idea? When you're texting him, if I do or say this or that, then he will do or say this and that. And then I'll be okay. Then everything's going to be all right. 
Okay, so mom didn't understand you. You were just talked to, not with. Yeah, it sounds like, you know, I used to get gaslighted a lot and I didn't even know what that meant. Now I know what it means. Okay. So the pattern you're using to keep this relationship going now is sounds like control because you're getting in there and putting up your, your dukes. All right. And how's your pride affected by this? Well, you're getting something out of it. That's that's the bottom line answer. So that you're still getting something out of this. So that's what you got to find out. What am I getting from this that I still need? Yeah. <laughs> Look at all these double A's. Okay. Your pride's getting hurt because you can't affect a change. You're using your coda, you're doing everything right, and you still cannot get them to change. You know, that's that's hard. And <laughs> what are the consequences to the relationship? Where you could have, whereas you could have a healthy relationship with this guy, moving him all the way back to a one on the relationships level, because he's right. not trustworthy anymore. You could have that relationship with him, but you're not because you still need to affect this change that you know you can't make. You know, I don't mean to call you insane, but that sounds like it to me. You know, that's what it sounds like. So that's, let's see. So the really uh, stays unhealthy. And what would you say or do differently now? Right. Because dad's not going to change. So give up on that. You know, it, it actually feels better when you finally give up trying to change that stuff. Because then you get a little bit of peace. Okay. So good stuff. Uh, well, let's go ahead and give people a break. and. So you can get a chance to write a little bit if you want, bring up a scenario if you like, whatever you want to do. And I'm going to figure out how to wrap text in the meantime. All right, let's keep going. Okay. What on, are you acting out any unhealthy behaviors with it? Or is it just mental? Okay. What feelings are are urging you to use this behavior? Do you are do you think it's a low self esteem, or where do you think it's coming from? Yeah, yeah, that doesn't go away. Uh, it can though. It it's uh, Coda got me finally got me through the last stages of recovering from that because I was abused as well, and it skews your opinion of sex. It, it does. It makes it go sideways somehow. After that, you're just not, you don't see sex normally. Well, let me see. That's a bad word. Uh, for me, I, I went to, to the route of it. I could get attention. You know, I could gain and, and keep attention using sex. So that's the way I would start out my relationships, assuming that love would follow. That was what happened to me. Yours is, uh, is fantasizing. Is it, uh, uh I should probably not talk about this. Uh, don't want to get into the nature of it very much. But I, I would, since we can't really talk about this deeply here, maybe talk to your sponsor about it Tell them, and tell them where it's coming from. I mean, if you haven't been honest about that so far, get honest and tell them what's going on because there are ways to get past this. Absolutely. Um, yours what was said or done um okay so this affected you sexually obviously and uh let's see what pattern are you reacting with you said low self-esteem yeah uh when i was when I get angry, it's because I'm afraid of something. When I'm afraid of something, there's only two possibilities. One is I'm going to lose something I already have, or I'm not going to get something I think I want. So 
determine for yourself which one which one of those fears is involved. It could be just that this is never going to change. It's it's always going to be this way. I'm always going to feel bad. So that's where this is real. <clears throat> so that's where the problem comes in. <laughs> it's fear that you're going to go to hell instead of going to heaven. That's a big one. That's a big one. So you're a recovered Catholic. Why don't you do a, a sexual four step on this with your sponsor? And then if you, I mean, by, by way of an amend, you might want to make a confession if that is something that you feel like you should do to get past this. Because I, as I understand it, that's what it takes. <clears throat> Gosh, I'm sorry. <clears throat> might want to go that route just to uh, to get rid of this whole thing once and for all. That seems to be the, the last step for you to get rid of it. So I, I honestly, I would recommend to you to go through that process in the Catholic way, because that seems to be the last stand. There's, there's a, you know, you're still angry with God. I absolutely get that. Thanks a lot. This has been great fun. Plus I'm an alcoholic. That's fantastic. But I'm here now. So if you are, can can get into the acceptance of this is what happened, can't change that. So let's go through that steps and get this, get that hell thing out of the way. You know, you don't need to be dwelling on that because if you've got that, then everything else is bad too. You know, I, I, I know you, you probably don't want to hear this, but I recommend you going to going through those Catholic steps. That's what I, that's what I recommend. But it, I'm just talking about to get hell off the table, you know. Okay, so let's pick a word from the bottom here. What do we have? Okay, so, <clears throat> so, okay, I rose up when my coda mother, uh, now, goodness gracious, Karen, come on. Um, Coda brother, what 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 was the topic? What was he yelling at you about? Okay, this is going to be this. yay. All right. <clears throat> what feelings urged you to freeze up? Okay. What did you want to gain from freezing up? Oh, yes. Okay. So what was, let me, let's try this one instead. Coda, brother, yelled at me. So you got him something and you got the wrong thing. Okay. So did this hurt you emotionally, physically, sexually, spiritually, or intellectually? How about I'm going to suggest spiritually as well. He is yeah. a spiritual brother, right? Okay. What pattern did you react with? It sounds like avoidance. Okay. All right. Uh, what was your old idea? Let's see. I would think, you know, somebody that's in CODA shouldn't yell at anyone, but that's my idea. If what's your idea? If if I say you're like when you you said you got him something, if I get this for him, then he will appreciate me and I'll be happy. Is that sound about right? So that's you actually the reason you did it. It wasn't uh <clears throat> for him, it was for you. Okay. And then he yelled at you. That's bad on him. Okay. So what are you using now to keep the relationship going? What have you decided you need to do? Let's see. Okay, good. Actually, I'm glad you're looking at that, uh, looking at it that way. I'm gonna do my my next uh, thing that I just decided to do as a workshop on. Is there another way I can look at this? There always is, always. And this is a good way. Gratitude that he's showing you who he is so that you don't get caught up in that he's a super nice guy period because he's got his quirks just like everybody else yeah. so 
the pattern that you're using to keep the relationship going sounds like control. You're yes. throwing a boundary. Okay. Okay. How was your pride affected? That's where the stubbornness comes in. He's wronger than I am, period. That's right. it. And he isn't who you thought he was. Sometimes people in recovery are sicker than people who are out of recovery. It's the weirdest thing. So we, we tend to put labels on people and, and how fantastic they are. He's got X amount of years in sobriety and in code and stuff. That doesn't mean diddly squat if they're not working a good program. What are the consequences to the relationship? I didn't even want to wish him. I even want to wish him happy birthday. That's a total teardown of trust. If there's a lot of issues that happen here. He broke your trust, number one. He's supposed to be this kind of guy, and he's not. So it's good. Like you said, I get to see him now. Now, now I don't depend on him anymore. But if, <clears throat> if you had a chance to yell, to sorry, to handle this differently when he initially yelled at you, what would you do? What would you oh. say? When you, after you say that initial, ow, that hurt, you're pausing, which is good. And you can ask yourself, are they actually trying to hurt me? You know, what, what, what's the deal here? Are they trying to make me feel bad? The answer is usually no. And if they aren't trying to hurt me, then what's going on here? Am I overreacting? Am I bringing my childhood into the situation? Am I, you know, doubling down? We, we bring a whole ton of, of childhood stuff and those feelings are real and they come back crushingly and it feels the same as it did back then but now you're an adult acting like a child because you've been hurt again it's confusing and in that moment you don't know what to do it's like like you said frozen feelings it's easier if i just freeze up okay she's got a point there's uh, there's good news and bad news. I'm going to bring up the levels of friendship. And, and this is probably, if she had this, she would explain it to you. Let me share this, new share. Levels of friendship. The my, first time I heard about this, my sponsor showed me her version. And I've changed it a little bit, but I, I it's a generally the same. There are six different levels, not one. If you bring somebody like this guy in, out of six, which is way down here where very few people belong, you're bound to get hurt. Let's go through them real quick. This is good stuff. All relationships start out at a one, everybody you know. It's superficial. Uh, it's never a goal to move anybody forward. It's going to be based on their behavior towards you. Superficial is insignificant. That's where everybody starts. They don't affect your life one way or another. Superficial. They don't get inside. Level one is for people you've just met and for people who've been moved back from higher levels, like it sounds like this guy should be. Uh, people here are strictly surface relationships. You have no expectations, no obligations either way. So you don't expect him to behave normally, okay, if he's a one. And you don't expect to, um, or you don't, you don't have any expectations of them toward you. And you're not obligated to do anything with, for them. Uh, number two, cat, because there's a reason you went and got him that stuff. You're a rescuer. Yeah, it's okay, because that's where you get your uh, all your juju. But this guy didn't give you juju, and that's what hurts your pride. That's not what you're used to. Okay, so number two, casual. This person moved forward from level one due to common ground, such as coworkers, classmates, recovery people. During this probation stage, you will begin to evaluate this person to determine whether they should move forward to a higher level or just stay here. And it's okay to keep them there. Most of the people you know, 95% of the people won't move past it to. Okay, this because we're talking about everybody in the whole world. It's okay to have this relationship. Remember, you've only met their representative. You're going to look for red flags. Uh, this guy yelling at you twice is a red flag. How do they talk to them? A big one for me is how do they treat animals? If, if there's any mistreatment of animals in any way, they're gone. That They're a one forever. How do they talk about their ex? Are they a victim? 
Are you their only friend? Do they criticize you? Do they try to fix you? Do they try to isolate you? <clears throat> how long have how long have you known this guy? Okay, this might have been brought up by the trauma of surgery and things like that. So this could be an anomaly. It could be. So it might not have anything to do with you after all. Actually, it, it doesn't irregardless. Remember, you've only met their representative. Now, not, not with this guy. You've known him for a long time. Uh, the person you want, the person they want you to believe they are. You may have introduced them to your representative. After 90 days minimum, recheck for red flags if you're considering moving them forward. And then you check your own behavior. Are you being authentic with them? This doesn't really... Um, relate to your situation with him, but I would definitely keep him at a two. Uh, mm. You know, he had companionship. I don't know. This just seems a little bit 18 years. You're going to want to really take a look at this guy and see where he belongs here. Uh, companionship, this level begins your one-on-one -on -one relationships. It's been at least 90 days and they're off probation. Platonic roommates should be at least a three before you consider moving in with them. Uh, this isn't a romantic relationship. Is that correct? Okay. Uh, yeah. So that's as far as you're going to go with him. I'd say a, a two at the most. And uh, if you want to, e anybody wants to email me, I'll send you this whole thing, or you can listen to the uh, YouTube version. So, okay, let's get rid of that. You're welcome. You're welcome. I hope that works out. This might be an anomaly. I might be able to cut him a break on this one. I don't know. We'll so, see. Uh, Okay. All right. Let's get yeah. back to it. Thank you. That's interesting stuff. Okay. Oh, thanks for the heart. Let's figure this out. Let's go with, uh, hello, can you go? All right. Mom, death by a thousand cuts, you know? So she's affecting you emotionally, I'm guessing. Okay. Any other way? Is there another way in there that she does she insult your intellect or does she bother your spirituality? Yeah, it's you know, if she's jealous of you, you are not going to win with her. <laughs> I'm telling you what, because she has to take you down a couple of pegs. That's what she has to do to make herself feel better. It really has nothing to do with you. So, okay, you are reacting with avoidance. It's the laziest one. Probably. Okay. Now let's see on the one page, I'm going to bring up that one page under avoid and see specifically which one you're using. Uh, one page patterns. Here we are. Okay. So under avoidance, let's see what specifically you're doing. Uh, avoid intimacy as a way to maintain distance. That resonates. Okay. Uh, indirect or evasive communication to avoid conflict. I didn't realize that I was doing this, and I certainly was. People were walking on eggshells around me. Well, mm. I thought it was just me walking eggshells around them. She might be doing this with you, and that's why it's so tense. Uh, yeah. So when you go to see your mom, don't go as your child. Go as your adult. It's, it's different. It's different oh. when you go as an adult because your child gets hurt by everything, and your child assumes that there is hurt being inflicted, even if there isn't. So. Go home as an adult. That's my advice. The old idea. If I do or say this, she will do or say mm -hmm. that. And then she'll like me and I'll be happy. What is her, what is your old idea here? It, what do you think you have to do to make her like you? That's all I need. Just find the right words. It's like a magic phrase. And then she's going to like me and we're going to be cool from here on out. What pattern are you using to keep the relationship going? You're not. Avoidance. Okay. How's your pride affected? When she starts throwing those little jabs at you and stuff, what does your little girl think about that? You know, is it just like when your mom did it when you were young? Or That is your girl coming out and saying, don't you dare. You can't treat me like that. Because it's not fair. That that uh, justice scale that we have, mm -hmm. it's not fair. That's a big deal with codependence. And it's actually useless and works against us. And what is the consequence to the relationship? You don't have one, mm -hmm. right? How's this affecting your husband? 
It's amazing. What we're afraid of is actually the boogeyman. There's nothing to it. If you bring your adult, if you bring your little girl, then you have a lot to be afraid of. Uh, what would you do or say differently now with her? Are you going to go see her as an adult? Okay, you're welcome. So any uh, questions or comments? I'm so sorry we didn't have a chance to, to get to you. Okay, let's close it up.